Tonight on 7, all the big stories. President Trump acquitted. The Senate has spoken. We're live in D.C. The return of winter as we track a little snow and sleet early tomorrow. Then a Red Sox shocker. Mookie Betts and David Price heading out west. And six days and counting the candidates spreading out across New Hampshire. We're covering all the campaigns. 7 News at 5 starts now. And we begin at 5 with breaking news. Donald John Trump be, and he is hereby, acquitted of the charges in said articles. The impeachment trial is over. The Senate just voting to acquit President Trump. And the vote happening mostly along party lines, but not completely. Right, because former Massachusetts governor and current Utah senator, Republican Mitt Romney, the only member of the GOP in the Senate who voted to convict on one of the charges. The acquittal bringing it uh, close to the third presidential impeachment trial in American history. Let's go right to the nation's capital with Dan Housley with a look at the vote and other developments today. Dan? Well, oh, Adam and uh, Kim, it was a moment in history. The third U.S. president impeached and then acquitted of the charge. We've seen for weeks now the Capitol Hill lawmakers, the Senate particularly lately, debating, making statements, but today they were asked to say just one thing, guilty or not guilty. Donald John Trump be, and he is hereby, acquitted of the charges in said articles. The senators stood one by one, first on the abuse of power charge. On that charge, the vote was 52 to 48 to acquit. And remember, they needed 66 to convict here. There was one senator crossing party lines. Mitt Romney voted for the conviction charge, saying he was convinced the president had committed a grievous act. On the abuse of power charge, though, Mitt Romney stayed with his party by a 53 to 47 vote. Uh, it was by strictly party lines they rejected the charge of abuse of Congress. Mitt Romney explaining earlier why he was voting to convict the president. The allegations made in the articles of impeachment are very serious. As a senator juror, I swore an oath before God to exercise impartial justice. I am profoundly religious. My faith is at the heart of who I am. I take an oath before God as enormously consequential. I knew from the outset that being tasked with judging the president, the leader of my own party, would be the most difficult decision I have ever faced. I was not wrong. After that speech, the president has yet to react, but his son, Donald Trump Jr., tweeted, Mitt Romney is forever bitter that he will never be POTUS, president of the United States. He was too weak to beat the Democrats then, so he's joining them now. He's now officially a member of the resistance and should be expelled from the GOP. As far as the Massachusetts senators, uh, we have uh, Senator Warren, uh, and Senator Markey both voting guilty on the charge of abuse of power and guilty on the charge of obstruction of Congress. President Trump has been seen today but has not been heard on the subject of impeachment. He greeted the president of Venezuela at the White House. There was to be some time inside the Oval Office where we normally would hear from the president. That was canceled. We'll have to see what the White House has to say and what the president has to say, but that has yet to come. The White House was hoping for some kind of bipartisan vote against impeachment. Instead, they got a marginally bipartisan vote for conviction of the president with Republican Senator Mitt Romney crossing party lines on the vote of abuse of power. Live on Capitol Hill, Dan Housley, 7 News. Dan, uh, we know and our viewers uh, certainly know that you've been in D.C. really since uh, 2016 when the, when the new administration, the Trump administration, came in and then since the beginning of this impeachment uh, trial. Um, as you just draw back and reflect on what you've experienced, and this is important for our viewers who, who don't get to be where you are, um, but it really is a piece of history that, that you have witnessed. So as a reporter, uh, what are your thoughts as this all comes to a close? 
Well, I think through the most partisan time in our nation of recent history, we have seen that the system is working. Uh, it is working for Americans. It is good that we have an election coming up soon. Uh, so those who are not happy with what happened can voice their choice. Those who are happy with what happened can voice their choice. And hopefully, uh, after an election, maybe we can have a bit more coming together. Uh, I say a bit more because, as uh, Senator McConnell said, this is the end of impeachment, but it is not an end of the partisan rancor. Uh, fortunately, the government has been able to get some things done. Uh, but there are things that haven't been able to be done because of the partisan nature. But that's just where we are today. This is a symptom of our nation and not a cause of the problem. Uh, now we get a choice, and you'll see that coming up in New Hampshire within days, and that's the good news, is we have a democracy, we have a choice, and here today the senators had their choice, and they made it. Uh, it is a democratic process. It is a republic system and the system works. They've been quoted many times. We've heard from both sides, what kind of government do we have? Benjamin Franklin saying, a republic, if we can keep it. I think today we saw we can keep it. Back to you. Yeah, uh, to extend your point, Dan, it's a question of uh, whether something like this emboldens the democracy or somehow um, erodes it. But we will certainly be on this as we continue. So we haven't heard from President Trump himself, but we have heard from his campaign. And again, this is a campaign statement, and it says the following. President Trump has been totally vindicated, and now it's time to get back to the business of the American people. The do-nothing Democrats know they can't beat him, so they had to impeach him. This terrible ordeal was always a campaign tactic to invalidate the 2016 votes of 63 million Americans and was a transparent effort to interfere with the 2020 election only nine months away. And since the president's campaign only got bigger and stronger as a result of this nonsense, the impeachment hoax will go down as the worst miscalculation in American political history. And again, that is from the campaign manager of the Trump 2020 campaign. So we hear a lot of interesting language at the State of the Union last night. We saw the president turn his back when Speaker Pelosi tried to shake hands. And it ended with this stunning moment when Speaker Pelosi actually shredded the uh, speech, the copy of the speech she received of the State of the Union that the president had given her. We invite now again our constitutional law expert, Lawrence Friedman from New England law. And Professor, I think uh, Americans want to see some uh, cross, you know, some, some agreement between these lawmakers, but it seems more divisive than ever. What happens uh, today and moving forward in your opinion? Well, uh, I think that Dan is right that in, at least in broad outlines, the system set up by the framers worked and we had an impeachment process in the House and a trial in the Senate uh, roughly along the lines that they envisioned. But they didn't account for what the fallout might be, both if a president were acquitted and if a president were acquitted when he still has a chance to run for election a few months later. Uh, and this election now will be seen as a second opportunity, as Dan said, for the people who believe that President Trump is guilty of the articles of impeachment to have their say. Could you, uh, Professor, uh, last question here. Could you just give us, uh, as objective as possible, but uh, from your academic standpoint, um, whether this process and, and where we've landed today um, helps President Trump in his 2020 election or indeed hurts him? And, and not just the president, maybe uh, Congress as well. I, I just don't know the answer to that. I think it's too soon to tell. I think that we all know that some of this is necessarily political, that impeachment is a political process. But as we saw Senator Romney today, uh, a number of our representatives in Washington on, in both houses were taking this seriously and, and taking steps and making votes that might not help them politically at all. Professor uh, Lawrence Friedman from New England Law, thank you again for your insight and your time with us today. And we have just learned that the president will be making a statement tomorrow at noontime. We will have that for you live. But right now, let's talk about the New Hampshire primary, the impeachment vote taking a few senators away from the primary. Senators Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, and Amy Klobuchar all traveling from New Hampshire after a day of campaigning yesterday to go to Washington this afternoon to cast their impeachment votes. Yeah, uh, might be back in the sky as we speak, going back up north.
forth. But they were up early joining other candidates on the campaign trail in New Hampshire, working hard to gain supporters ahead of Tuesday's first in the nation primary in New Hampshire. We do have a team of reporters following each of these candidates from their push for votes to the state of the Democratic Party, as well as the results of our latest exclusive 7 News Emerson College New Hampshire tracking poll. We have it all for you. So let's get started with 7's Alex Soprato, who is live in Manchester right now. Alex. Well, Kim, Senators Warren as well as Senator Sanders held morning events this morning here in New Hampshire, and then they left to go to Washington, D.C. for the impeachment vote. They, along with Senator Amy Klobuchar, are the U.S. senators running for president, and they all say this was part of their duty. We'll go as long as we can go, and then when I've got to go catch the plane, we'll go catch the plane. I am not going to miss that vote. Senator Elizabeth Warren cutting short her after rally selfie line to leave New Hampshire and head to Washington. Usually I can stay forever to do selfies. Today, I'm headed to Washington to vote for the impeachment of Donald Trump. Warren, like Senator Bernie Sanders, only holding morning rallies in the Granite State today. Uh, and the reason I'm wearing a tie is I'm going to be on a plane in a few minutes uh, going to Washington, D.C to vote for the impeachment of President Trump. With Democrats locked in a battle for New Hampshire, the vote takes the senators running for president off the trail. And this is serious business. And it's something that I have taken seriously. You know, frankly, I would have preferred to be campaigning in New Hampshire and Iowa during the period, but an impeachment is a rarity. It is of enormous consequence and it's something that I have taken seriously. Senator Amy Klobuchar agreeing. This election, just like the trial that I've been in the last few weeks, bolted to my desk in the Senate, just like that, it is a patriotism check. It is a decency check. All three senators, they are voting for those articles of impeachment. And Senator Warren releasing a statement just a few minutes ago. She says today is a shameful day for the U.S. Senate and a somber day for the U.S. Constitution and a sad day for the United States of America. Live in Manchester, New Hampshire, I'm Alex DiPrato, 7 News. Former Vice President Joe Biden seems to be losing a little bit of support heading into the New Hampshire primary. And we're saying that because of the results of the Iowa caucus that we've seen so far aren't in his favor. Yes, let's show you where things stand right now. Obviously, a big delay out of Iowa. But now, 75% of precincts reporting. Still not 100% out of the Iowa caucus. But here you see the former Vice President in fourth place. He is behind former Indiana Mayor Pete Buttigieg. And then next comes uh, Senator Sanders and Senator Warren. The Democratic Party of Iowa just announcing it will be tweaking some of the results, so we're waiting to hear if that changes the tally, and we will, of course, pass it along to you. Right now, let's go to 7's Byron Burnett. He is live in Manchester with the latest from the Biden campaign. Byron. Well, Joe Biden admits that Iowa was not his finest hour, but when I talked to him today, he said that his fight for the nomination is far from over. Sir, we're going to jump President, right here. Sir, we're going to jump right there. How big of a setback was Iowa being in fourth place with the vice president? Well, it's not over yet, but it was a setback, and we're, that's why we're going to win here. we got to get up. Joe Biden telling 7 News he's trying to put Iowa behind him. But today at a campaign stop in Summersworth, New Hampshire, he admitted a possible fourth-place finish in the Iowa caucuses doesn't feel very good. I am not going to sugarcoat it. We took a gut punch in Iowa. The whole process took a gut punch. But look, uh, this isn't the first time in my life I've been knocked down. And now the former vice president is throwing a few punches of his own, taking a shot at his Democratic rival, Bernie Sanders. But if Senator Sanders is a nominee for the party, every Democrat will have to carry the label Senator Sanders has chose for himself, chosen for himself. He calls him, and I don't criticize him, he calls himself a Democratic Socialist. Well, we're already seeing what Donald Trump is going to do with that. And Biden is also taking aim at the other Iowa frontrunner, Pete Buttigieg. Mayor Pete likes to attack me as well. Calls me part of the old failed Washington. Well, really? Was it a failure that I went to Congress to get Obamacare passed in the law? Was it a failure when I got passed the Implementation of the Recovery Act that prevented an economic collapse and another Great Depression? 
and Biden insists he's still the best candidate who can take on President Trump. That's the latest live here in Manchester, New Hampshire. I'm Byron Barnett, 7 News. Moments like this show some of the tension between Democrats and Republicans heading into the election. You see House Speaker Nancy Pelosi ripping up her copy of the president's speech immediately following the president's State of the Union last night. That's not the only thing that voters see that they're not sure that they like that's causing concern. Seventh Kimberly Bookman spoke with voters in Manchester. Kimberly with more on their mindset heading into the first of the nation primary. Kim, we are live outside of one of the most popular diners in all of New Hampshire. This is a place that candidates come to press the flesh with voters. And inside, they certainly had opinions on this. It was the rip seen round the country. When House Speaker Nancy Pelosi tore a copy of President Donald Trump's State of the Union address last night, was she also tearing up the Democrats' chance in the upcoming election? To find the answer, we went to Manchester's Red Arrow Diner, a political institution. Pictures on the wall show the path to the White House goes right through this New Hampshire restaurant. It's been a bad week for the party, right? I mean, when you start out not even be able, being able to count votes, that's uh, unbelievable in this day and age. On Tuesday, the Democratic Party failed to tally their votes in the Iowa caucuses, causing the president to tweet, the Democrat caucus is an unmitigated disaster. Nothing works, just like they ran the country. And I think they're trying to find their way forward. Voters we talked to say the Democrats don't seem to have a unified platform of issues and that their stances on topics like health care are all over the map. There's a dichotomy in where the party is, right? There's so many extremes. The things that Bernie Sanders is talking about would be very different from maybe what Joe Biden is talking about. With event after event in New Hampshire this week, each Democrat is trying to win over voters. But veteran Burt Gosselin, who's watching it all play out on TV, says he's tuning them all out. They hurt themselves by being over stressing, over stressing, over stressing. Oh my God, were you to death? I turn it over to Flintstones after a while. And a Democratic strategist says if the party doesn't get this together very soon, it will be four more years of Donald Trump. Reporting live from Manchester, New Hampshire, Kimberly Bookman, 7 News. You might have uh, noticed in, in some of the rhetoric that these candidates have been focusing on younger voters. That group is likely to play a big role in this next election. Some of the candidates reaching out to young voters at an event today. So we'll shed more light on that with Natalie Pozo live in Concord, New Hampshire, where she spoke with some high school and college students today. Natalie? Yeah, Adam, several of the candidates making their way through this day-long town hall. It focused on climate and clean energy. The panel was actually made up of students. The candidates realize that they have to win over that young vote to get ahead. One by one, candidates taking the stage at a youth climate and clean energy town hall in Concord. How will you ensure that these vulnerable communities are protected from the existing impacts of climate change? Taking questions from students. These are like the best questions I've ever had at a forum. Young voters are going to play a key role in the 2020 election. In our exclusive 7 News Emerson College, New Hampshire tracking poll, Bernie Sanders leading among voters between 18 and 29. Andrew Yang coming in second at 12 percent. Pete Buttigieg falls third among that age group. As the youngest candidate running for president, issues from climate change to making sure we have an economy that works for us are personal. They affect me, and they're affecting the, the children that Chastin and I hope one day to have, too. In our one-on-one -on -one with Democratic presidential candidate Pete Buttigieg, he tells me he is confident those votes will go up. I'm committed so much to the issues that are on the minds of young voters and the issues that can bring us together as a country. Our tracking poll finds that 73 percent of young voters want a candidate with similar views, while 27 percent want a candidate that can beat President Donald Trump. I think with 2020, the youth vote will be motivated, and having seen what happened in 2016, will be energetic to go and prevent that from ever happening again. And according to our exclusive 7 News Emerson College tracking poll, 74 percent of voters in that age range of 18 to 29 believe that Bernie Sanders will be the nominee. We're live tonight in Concord, New Hampshire. Nathalie Pozo, 7 News. And there's movement in our exclusive 7 News Emerson College tracking poll. Former Indiana Mayor Buttigieg, Buttigieg gaining the most support among New Hampshire Democratic voters. The numbers getting an apparent boost from those results in Iowa. But Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders is still in the top spot. Let's go to 7's Justin Doherty live in Manchester to break down those numbers for us, Justin. 
And Kim, good evening. That's absolutely correct. Just days ago, we saw Senator Klobuchar with a big boost, but now that belongs to Mayor Pete, all while at the same time, Senator Sanders stands alone at top. Pete Buttigieg breaking away from the pack and jumping five points in our most recent 7 News Emerson College tracking poll. The boost puts the former mayor in a solid second place. We're seeing Mayor Pete get a bounce out of Iowa. Now that bounce usually dissipates over the next couple of days. But Mayor Pete still sits behind a formidable front runner in New Hampshire, Senator Bernie Sanders. Voters know what they're getting with Bernie Sanders, and until there's a real alternative for them to consider, right now I think he's still got a strong chance to take New Hampshire. In our exclusive 7 News Emerson College poll, Sanders has 32 percent. Mayor Pete is at 17 percent, again up five points, which is the biggest gain so far in our poll. Former Vice President Joe Biden is at 13 percent. That's unchanged from Tuesday. Minnesota Senator Amy Klobuchar has 11 percent. That's down one point. Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren is also at 11 percent. That's down two points from Tuesday. Now to the candidates in single digits. Entrepreneur Andrew Yang is at 6%. That's up one point. Hawaii Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard is also at 6%. She's up two points. Businessman Tom Steyer is at 2%. He's down three points. Former Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick is now at 1%. He's up one point from zero. And Colorado Senator Michael Bennett remains at zero. Our Emerson College pollster Spencer Kimball says Sanders has benefited most from his consistency. You might disagree with some of his policies, but he does and change them and his voters know that and I think that's what keeps him with a strong base. The candidate in the most trouble, Kimball says, Sanders, is Joe please. Biden. He's in a tough place because if he goes too negative and you start throwing mud at other candidates, you always have a little bit on yourself and he's at the point where he could drop into single digits. As for what Mayor Pete and the other candidates must do to keep or gain momentum. In New Hampshire, voters want to meet the candidates. So the most important thing that they can do is get here and start talking to voters, start shaking hands and telling them what they're going to do to make their lives better. Now, our pollster also says we're starting to see a three-tier system in these poll numbers where you have Senator Sanders at top and then the group vying for second and then that third group. We'll have a deeper dive and to know those numbers coming up here at 7 News at 6 o'clock. Live in Manchester, New Hampshire this evening. Justin Dory, 7 News. And in fact, you should know that every night at 11 leading up to the primary, our 7 News Emerson College tracking poll will show you how the race has changed in the last 24 hours in this key contest. Stay with the news station for the latest developments developments on the New Hampshire primary. We will have coverage of each campaign here on air and online and on our mobile and tablet apps as well. We are following more news today. Mookie Betts and David Price heading west. The Red Sox trading them both to the Los Angeles Dodgers. The move expected to save the team a lot of money. Front office obviously thinks it's a good move, but many others in Red Sox Nation do not. Sports Director Joy Mercino in our newsroom now. This trade is not being received well by Red Sox Nation, and now Red Sox Brass must explain how trading Mookie Betts, their best player and arguably the second best position player in the world, will somehow make their team better in the near future. We're not doing our jobs if we're not open to anything that can you know, improve our chances to compete as successfully and as often as possible over the course of the next decade. And for Red Sox Chief Baseball Officer Haim Bloom, that includes dealing away a former MVP in the prime of his career. Oh, there's another one. Crushed by Mookie Betts. Watch it fly. Totally out of Fenway. Along with arguably the team's best pitcher in a franchise-altering move that gets the Red Sox under the luxury tax threshold. The blockbuster trade sending shockwaves throughout Major League Baseball, leaving Red Sox fans torn over the departure of the 27-year-old Betts, and it even caught the attention of Celtics head coach Brad Stevens. So I'm a fan of his, but I'm a fan of the Red Sox, and um, yeah, I'll, stu I'll still root hard for both. Brad Stevens expressing a feeling shared by many in New England about this trade because Mookie Betts is extremely likable. David Price... That's another story. Reporting live in the newsroom, Joe M. Racino, 7 News. Coming up at 5.30, hear what fans have to say about these two star players saying farewell to Fenway. No other distraction like a coat for uh, incoming objects. Jeremy, let's talk about that. What are we looking uh, for? 
ahead to this week. Yeah, no doubt about that. We are tracking not one but two storms, and the first storm will have a little cold air to play with tomorrow morning. Light snow arriving after midnight tonight, about 3 or 4 a.m. tomorrow morning. And then for a few hours, a mix of snow, sleet, freezing rain, and then just plain old rain by midday in the afternoon. And then another batch of rain, locally heavy rain, for Friday morning. We do have a winter weather advisory in effect for much of southern New England for the area shaded in purple for a few hours of some light snow and light freezing rain and light sleet. Storm impact. It's not a powerhouse storm. It's not heavy amounts of snow or sleep, but it is occurring during the morning commute, and that is the problem uh, as we get to early tomorrow morning. Temps right now, 30s to around 40, the city at 40. But you notice on the map here, there's no Arctic air out ahead of this storm. And so yet again, it's another storm that will offer minimal amounts of snow and sleet. Here you go. Here's your timeline. 3 o'clock tomorrow morning. Light snow moving out of Connecticut, Rhode Island, getting to Metro Boston. So your morning commute, 5 a.m., we'll start with some light snow. But you notice also the pink and the green. That's the narrow ribbon of sleet and freezing rain and then plain old rain that will easily come up into Boston between say 6.30 and 7.30 tomorrow morning. It's a slower process, though, north of the Pike, certainly north of the Route 2 corridor, so you'll have several hours of some light precipitation. At no point is this overwhelming snow or freezing rain, but it doesn't have to be overwhelming to have a messy morning commute, and that's what we face tomorrow morning. Then we get to midday tomorrow, and the brunt of the precipitation shuts down. I do think there will be pockets of freezing drizzle well inland, Worcester County, and just plain old drizzle everywhere else with temperatures tomorrow climbing into the lower 30s. So how much snow is on the way as well as sleet? Looks like an inch or less for much of the region. And then you get up into northern Worcester County, extreme northwest Middlesex County, but primarily across southern New Hampshire, one to three inches of snow and sleet and a little bit of glaze ice on top of that. Your ice forecast, I do think, will be somewhat of a problem in the Worcester Hills. We're not worried about power disruption. It's not that kind of an ice storm. And the ground is relatively warm, so this would be un elevated untreated surfaces that are going to be most prone to that icy glaze tomorrow morning. Traveling is poor for a couple of hours early in the day and then as we work into the afternoon hours we'll have wet roads for your evening commute. So that is storm number one. Here comes storm number two early Friday morning and that will feature heavier precipitation but there's less cold air. So we're not worried about sleet, snow or freezing rain Friday morning. What we'll have Friday morning are pockets of heavy rain. There'll be heavy snow in northern New England and that may try to end as a little bit of light snow Friday evening here in southern New England but otherwise it, Friday is just a rainy cold raw day with most towns about a half an inch to an inch of rain on the way for a Friday. Saturday will feature mostly sunny skies and perhaps a few snow flurries on Sunday. Josh is back at 5:30. Okay, thank you, Jeremy. Busy day and much more to come tonight. In fact, stay right there because we have 7 News at 530 next.